Within the world of Maiden Abyss resides a small civilization called Orth. Orth is a small island located in the southern sea of Biluska, which inhabits the both beautiful but ambiguous crater called the Abyss. According to the narrator, approximately 1,900 years ago from the present day was when the pit was first discovered, which is kind of weird when we take into consideration the 2,000 year cycle, but whatever, foreshadowing I guess. It sits with a diameter of around 1,000 meters and a depth of unknown value. Its very existence mesmerized people, the sense of adventure, adrenaline of exploration, the valuable and mysterious relics that reside within it, and the creatures that linger within its layers are driving forces for exploration. The Abyss's bottom has yet to be discovered, and only those who dare challenge the Grand Crevice will be rewarded with its answers. Greetings everyone, welcome to the first episode of Abyss Theory. Now, before I begin, I just want to say I'm not the type of person who usually engages in theory crafting, yet this franchise is so much fun to talk about that I can't help but want to join in the discussion. These small videos will be possibly based on the theories and ideas of the community, both Piccolese alike, as well as the followers of the show and from other sources outside of YouTube, and sometimes even my own interpretations of the story. As of right now, I'm scaring my brain for an idea to talk about, but there are just far too many. Perhaps the curse of the second layer is causing me some nausea or something. Anyway, within the first episode, I want to focus on a relatively wordy interpretation posed by one of my viewers under the name Alex, whose last name will be disclosed for privacy reasons, and a theory that's been prompted around the internet for some time. Now, I'll link Alex's discussion um, of what he finds to be of interest throughout the show in the description, but I warn you, for those who haven't caught up on the manga, spoilers are apparent, and those who are only anime fans, I apologize, but this episode is not for you. Though I will be sure to create theories based on the first 13 episodes in other videos, however, this one is not one of those, you have been warned. This episode will contemplate the very existence of a certain character who resides in the capital of the Unreturned, as well as ideas relating to two unseen other white whistles, Wakuna, the Lord of Guidance, and Sorojo, the Lord of Mystery. Without further ado, my fellow Delvers, let's get exploring! So the first theory we'll be decoding is Alex's perception of the two still mysterious figures, Sorajo and Wakuna. Now, I want to talk about Sorajo because I'm a huge, huge fan of what Alex had to say about him because funnily enough, I had my suspicions on the character and some of what I believe is written in this context, but he also posed a thought of a different view, which caught me by surprise. Now, when we look at Sorajo at first glance, well, what do we notice? Well, above all else, we see a Plague Doctor-like appearance for starters, the White Whistle, which I believe is supposed to be reminiscent of like a crow and its wings to foreshadow his observer-like appearance and persona, and we know he carries some kind of large coffin-like instrument on his back. Now, we know at this point in time that White Whistles themselves, and I'm talking about the non-sentient objects, well, kind of sentient objects, well, the white things around their necks, are made from life reverberating stones, which are created from the death of another human who possesses a strong sense of loyalty or compassion to the owner of the whistle. As for who perished for Sorajo, there's only speculation around the topic. Well, this entire thing is speculation, let's be honest. But Alex believes that it could perhaps be from a patient by whom was under Sorajo's operation, but sadly could not be saved and became a life reverberating stone because of the good intent found in Sorajo. Great theory, even if you personally don't like the idea yourself. My interpretation is that the Doctor's appearance is simply symbolic for the ideas behind an ethical Doctor, like occupation, one who may be looking to find the cure for the birthday curse on the surface, and that that person who died became his white whistle was a child who on their birthday died and asked Sarajo to investigate it. That's my guess. Yet of course, in theory crafting, it is important to think on both sides. If it weren't for Alex, I may have just considered my side of thinking. If you aren't aware, Plague Doctors themselves don't cater to a hero-like personality. In fact, Plague Doctors themselves are medical practitioners who were tasked with treating the people who inherited the plague. Yet they are not professionally trained, nor are they experienced surgeons. They would charge families additional fees for special treatments, but only provide false cures. Whole new level of placebo effect. And not only that, Something I didn't know that Alex informed me of was the fact that they would inhabit bacteria on their coats and then would spread pestilence even more, meaning more people required their treatment. If we consider this, then maybe Sirajo isn't as friendly as he appears. 
After all, even Ozen clearly states that Bondroot is the most scandalous of the White Whistles, but to still take caution when interacting with the others. And not only that, it's also based on Ozen's interpretation and what she's been witness to over the course of her lifetime. Sirajo resides in a place that is exceptionally hard to reach. As of his current life decisions and motivations, we still know nothing. Only that he resides within the Abyss and due to its effects on human mentality and rationality, it can be speculated that he may even be the main antagonist. As for the effects on rationality, the best example I can give is Bondrood, who appeared to be normal once upon a time until his interaction with the special great artifact the Soul Slay Machine Zoelic, and this caused his conscience to alter with every change, as well as Nanachi's warnings of people posing danger within the Abyss in episode 12. Now let's quickly move on to Wakuna. Again, starting from the basics, we know that he has an old man like appearance with Fabio like hair, might I add, which I believe is probably white and has grown to an excessive length due to his age. Alex and I both agree that he is likely a good character, though the possibility of him being malevolent is still a possibility. Pointing out that his whistle is indeed reminiscent of a dolphin, and from my understanding is commonly in spiritual literature related to the career of spirits of the dead and their duty resides in bringing them onto the next reality, kind of sounds familiar when we relay this idea to Wakuna's name as the Lord of Guidance. His task is likely related to guiding explorers of the Abyss throughout the seventh layer and teaching them the requirements and demands of the Abyss within that layer. Or it could even be possible that, based on the monk-like appearance, he was once a teacher or mentor of explorers like Moon Whistles. This hints that he's indeed exceptionally knowledgeable and has learned of such things during his long-lived lifetime within the deeper layers of the Abyss, and for that reason he can provide guidance under the harsh conditions of the seventh layer. Alex's assumption is that Wakuna's first encounter with the party would be an unpleasant one. Uh, as a result of his continued time within the Abyss, it would drive him mad. Though I actually picture Wakuna as someone who is indeed mad, but with a playful side similar to the Earthbender King Boomy from The Last Airbender. Now again, this is all just speculation, most of it's based on interpretation rather than fact. But now let's move on to the theory. So the theory I'm going to talk about, I'm not personally certain of. I will try to explain my understanding of it and try to use what I believe are factual events and times that transpired within the series. A common belief throughout the internet is that Faputa's identity is likely the reincarnation of Riko's soul as a result of her stillborn delivery on the fourth layer, but then was brought back to life with the use of an unknown relic. Now yes, again, possible, as Faputa knows of Reg's name and it was only given to Reg by Riko in Orth. It is briefly mentioned in the anime and showcased in the manga that Riko previously owned a dog and tried to hide it in the orphanage. The dog's name was Reg. Now, yes, there is the whole Reg is the reincarnation of Riko's dog theory, but that's for another day. Back on the Faputa. So she's considered the reincarnation of Riko. Sure, seems plausible, right? What is it, though? Again, this is just an opinion, and I believe it might be a counter-argument, but hey, if there's something you guys know that I don't, please let me know in the comments below. But let's think for a second, if we're lumping Faputa's lifeline with the idea of knowing Reg's name, there is an issue. Faputa's reincarnation likely took place not too long after Riko's death. She appears to be of the same age of the trio, which means she grew into a child over time. But if her birth played alongside Riko's birth, the time in which Riko had a dog on the surface would mean that Faputa would be coexisting in the Abyss. She would have no possible way of knowing Reg's name based on Riko's experience with her dog. It's a bit confusing, I know, but I think it upholds some kind of truth. I mean, even Reg seemed quite aware of this during Chapter 42 when they first met. If Faputa is the reincarnation of Riko, then she is completely unaware of this, as would Riko be. I think that sounds kind of silly. I believe if you throw that in, it would just kind of not fit. But hey, it's Akito, so if it is what it is, I believe in my boy to give us the results we want. So Paputa knows of Reg's name for a different reason, though for some reason she is <laughs> also interested in his pee, pee My assumption is that Paputa and Reg likely shared a history that transcends the current friendship with Rico, that being perhaps Reg and Paputa made a promise to each other long before about being together. This I'm gathering based on the three panels that represented a flashback of Reg's departure from Faputa, but perhaps Reg proposed to return to Faputa when losing his memories and has completely forgotten about his pledge. His pledge maybe was to bring Faputa his most precious possession, that being Riko and Anachi. Why? Well, I'm not exactly sure as of just yet. When they are reunited, their first interaction quickly spurs into 
Faputa asking if rank has brought his haku, which apparently translates to most valuable possession. If we relay it to Faputa as Rex creator, then maybe for experimentation? Yes, I mean, I'm kind of dwelling into the Faputa being Rex creator thing. I mean, if we're trying to fill that sort of void, you could say that Faputa seems to know a lot about Reg. She knows of Reg's organ placement, as when Bondry pierces Reg's stomach, he proclaims that Reg's biology is reminiscent of a human body. And Faputa immediately punctures his belly to test to see if Reg is the real Reg. I don't believe it's a romantic relationship, but instead Paputa considers Reg like a bodyguard, personal toy, or even creation. Also, just another thing, if Paputa and Rico are connected, I don't believe Paputa would pass off Rico's existence as simply the human child. It seems a bit too conditioned of a response, especially considering Paputa's rather confronting and yandia like vibe. And there is no way to say that Lies is named Reg after the dog, as it's apparent that the dog that exists as a segue into Reg's name was alive on the surface when Rico was older. Liza and Rico separated when Rico was only two, as that was when Liza went on her last dive. With that, hopefully I've brought to light some tools you guys can use to further break down the subject matter. Of course I'm not the most intelligent person out there, and half of what I'm proclaiming are simply what-if scenarios. Though I believe everyone has the right to put out an idea, and rather than receiving criticism, they should be given feedback, and if disbeliefs exist between the two parties, they should discuss it like adults, rather than blatantly calling out each other's ideas as stupid and illogical. We, as the children of the netherworld, have the right to dream and wonder after all. Anyway, I have been your Moon Whistle Navigator Mickle Pickle the Curious, Hopefully you enjoyed the first episode of Abyss Theory, and I hope to see you again next week. If you guys have any suggestions as to what I should talk about in the next episode, or if you have any theories you want me to share that you have, please let me know at themakerpickle.gmail.com. I'll be sure to try to cover as many as I can. Though, if we could, I'd like to talk a bit more about the dog reincarnation theory, as well as the many theories related to the 2000 year cycle. Those would be a lot of fun to talk about in the second episode, I believe. Without further ado, I'll leave you all here. Keep on keeping on, my fellow Delvers.